come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall with another tale of the macabre. Macabre suggests a dance of death. Death is a skeleton who leads others to the grave. In this story, a respected middle-aged man, Philip Chambers, becomes an agent for death because death placed in his hands a temptation he could not resist. Avarice, one of the seven mortal sins. In the short space of three days, avarice, an almost physical greed for wealth, brought terror and disaster to this man and to his family. Who are you? Where is it, Mr. Chambers? What are you doing in my basement? How did you get in here? Let's have it, Mr. Chambers. You don't want to get hurt, do you? This is a real gun. I've used it before. I know how to use it. Let him have it, Nick. Let's get out of here. Not until Mr. Chambers turns it over to us. How about it, Mr. Chambers? What is it you want? The money. Eighty grand. It's ours. And you've got it someplace down here. Now, turn it over, or I'll blow your head off. Our mystery drama, The Root of All Evil, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Roy Windsor and stars Norman Rose and Anne Shepard. Philip Chambers and wife Laura live in a small colonial house in Morris Manor, a village 30 minutes from New York. Its streets are tree-lined and quiet. Families take pride in their homes and land. It's a wealthy village, and most families have gardeners, not Philip Chambers. He's an organic gardener who enjoys grinding up all kinds of refuse for his compost heap and then returning it to the soil of his acre of land. That's where the trouble began. One Sunday morning at breakfast in their kitchen... Now, Phil, please don't run that shredder of yours before nine o'clock. Some people like to sleep on Sunday morning. I know, I know. I'll slick up the kitchen and you'll be back in time to clean up for church. You want the eggshells? Certainly. Uh, what have you done with the scraps? Oh, they're in the plastic bag. All the week stuff. I put the bag in the garbage bin last night. It was beginning to perfume the back porch. Get rid of it. My dear Laura, it will be ground to shreds within half an hour. And don't get your fingers caught in that fool machine. Ah, beautiful morning. Ah, let me see. Oh, there's a pretty large bag full of garbage. Better get the wheel back. What the... What the devil? Money. Packs of money. What? There must be thousands of dollars at the bottom of the bin. What? It's a fortune. It's a fortune. Where did it come from? What do I do with it? Hmm. Somebody hid the money there. But why? And whose is it? Phil? Uh, uh, yes. Joan Shelton just telephoned. It's in the news. I'm going to go across to read the article. Well, what's in the news? The robbery. You were asleep when all the excitement happened. I'll bring back the newspaper clipping, and I'll tell you all about it. I'll be right back. Uh, the, the, the robbery? I'll be right back. Robbery? What robbery? I must get to the basement. Good Lord. I, I've never held so much real money in my hands in all my life. Packs of hundred dollar bills. Fifty in a pack. I see ten of those. Oh, I can't believe it. Fifty thousand dollars. And thousand dollar bills. Thirty of them. Eighty thousand dollars. Oh, I'm rich. I'm rich. No more scrimping. No more fawning over persons for whom I have contempt. Begging work as a freelance copywriter. People who don't know as much as I've forgotten. This money... This money means I am free. Oh, it's got to be hidden. Whoever left that fortune in the garbage bin will try to get it back. Laura said there was a robbery. 
Maybe the thief hid the money. Let's see. Where will I put it? Small box. First, I'll, I'll place the money in this plastic bag. And then into that box the iris bulbs came in. Let's see. And then where? Let me see. Ah, yeah. Behind the basement window, under the porch. The siding runs to the ground. Eighty thousand dollars. And it's mine. And I won't give it up. Phil? Uh, uh, yes, Laura? Can you come up here for a minute? Oh, why, certainly. Come on out on the porch. I have that article. Uh, Laura, there was a robbery. Read. Uh, 2 a.m., Grove City Police. <laughs> Raced after three men in a... Hmm, crashed when they made a sharp turn at McKinley Street and Highland Avenue in Morris Manor. Well, that... Laura, that's our corner. And you slept right through the whole thing. Yeah, I must have. The sound could have wakened the dead. The police car was blasting its siren. Then there was a terrible crash when the robber's car hit old Mrs. Morris's elm tree and turned upside down. And one of the men was dead. Huh. Uh, and, and the other two, you, you said there were three. Must have got away. All of us had run outside, Dr. Shelton and Joan and I and the Moors and the McLeods, but the police told us to get back to our houses. They had their guns out, and they were searching for the missing men. Uh, how much did they get away with? Thousands, thousands of dollars, as much as 75 or 80,000. They tied up the night watchman and broke into the Grove City Federal Bank. Some alarm went off, so the police reached the bank just as the robbers jumped into their car, and they came tearing along this way. The police were right after them. You know, that, that was a nice elm tree of Mrs. Moore's. Is that all you've got to say? That was a nice elm tree of Mrs. Moore's? This is the most exciting thing we've had around here since the Hurricane Esther. And you're worried about Mrs. Moore's elm tree. You've got no adventure in your soul, Phil. <laughs> That's all right. You did have... Now the two of us are staid old middle-agers getting by and letting the world go by. I suppose so, Laura. Oh, you're not offended, Phil. No, no, of course not. My future's behind me, I'm afraid. No, it's not. You've done so much. You've written so many great advertising campaigns. Your skill hasn't worn away. You'll see. I'm certain it'll... it'll go well tomorrow. I hope so. But, Laura, face it, I'm 55. My lunch date and interview tomorrow is with a 26-year-old girl, almost fresh out of college. <laughs> Laura, I'm old enough to be your father. Why would she want to employ me? I'd be an embarrassment to her because I... Well, because I know too much. I don't see why. Well, you have to finish with your shredding, and I've got a dress for church. Well, uh, I decided not to use the shredder this morning. Oh, not enough garbage and refuse? Oh, no, no. Uh, all the excitement about last night has unnerved me. I'll get to the shredder next week. I'll be out of the shower in a few minutes. Well, don't hurry. I, I have some things to do in the basement. Oh, look, I've asked Dr. Shelton and Joan to come by at six for cocktails on the porch. All right? Huh? Oh, sure, sure, it's fine. <laughs> Look a gift horse in the face. <laughs> There's an old chestnut. When someone makes you a present, don't look too minutely into its intrinsic value. Eighty thousand dollars. Oh, that's some gift horse. Or is it? No. No, no, it's stolen money which I propose to steal. I hope it's safe behind that basement window. I better lock the garage, put that bag of garbage back in the bin, and then church. Paul, glass is empty, Doctor. Oh, two is my limit on a Sunday night, Laura. Joan? Oh, all right. I'm not operating at seven in the morning. <laughs> Phil? Phil? Hmm? Oh, oh, yes, yes, dear. Joan would like a refill. Your mind's a million miles away. Oh, I'm sorry, Joan. Uh, now, that was with water, right? Please. Paul, what do you think, really? I mean, about that robbery and the disappearance of the two men. Well, after looking at the car, Laura, I wonder how they came out of the accident alive. But they did. It's remarkable. And they disappeared with all that money. Almost $100,000. Oh, not quite that much, but a small fortune. How could they have escaped the police? <gasps> Maybe they're still hiding right in this neighborhood. Here's your drink, John. Thank you. 
They could be in hiding. Don't you think so, Paul? I can't imagine where. Someone's basement or attic. The Waynes are away for the month. Yes, they're they're at Candlestick Lake for a month. Well, surely they notified the police that they'd be away. Are there other vacant houses in the neighborhood, do you know? Yeah, yeah. The Murrays went away for the weekend to visit their son at Cass. So it's possible that the thieves could be hiding right around here. Hmm. Well, my guess is that they stole somebody's car and got themselves lost in the city. With $80,000 of hard-earned money. Well, insurance will cover the bank's loss. <sighs> Joan, my dear, I'm afraid it's time for the doctor to get to bed. What time? Oh, my dear, it's late. It's 10 o'clock. We came over here for cocktails. We stayed for salad and rolls. <laughs> <laughs> I'm delighted you did. Phil's been fidgety all day long. Your visit took his mind off his problems, didn't it, Phil? Hmm? Oh, yes, yes. Very happy that you came over. Don't work so hard, Phil. You have seemed preoccupied. Relax. Or uh, has the chatter about the mysterious robbers upset you? No. Oh, heavens no, no. You sure this is the house? Yeah. The whole light. When I get the cover off... Stick the light inside the can, way in. And then turn it on. Okay. Creepy out of here. Flash the light in the bottom of the can. See anything? No. Scrounge around. It's not there. It's gotta be there. Somebody beat us to it. What dirty... Shut up. Mike dead and 80 grand gone. Someone's got it. Maybe the garbage... Don't be been... stupid. There's no garbage pickup on Sunday. Well, maybe the people in the house seen it and called the fuzz. Maybe. Or maybe they kept it. You get kind of a surprise you open a garbage can and find 80 grand. Right on. I wonder who lives here. We gotta find out. If he's got the money, we'll sweat it out of him. But if he gave it to the cops... That we find out first. You crazy? We walk in and ask if they found the money, we'd be in the can in five seconds. You ever heard of the telephone? That's how we find out. And when we know, we come back. Now put the light away. I'll put the cover back on the can. Right. Then let's get out of here. Them bugs that go croak give me the shakes. Phil? Phil, is, is that you? Uh, what is it, Laura? Are you still awake? What's what's the, what's the matter? Can't you sleep? Is it cold on the porch? I'll get you another blanket. No, no, no. I'm 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 I'm, I'm all right. Go go back to bed, Laura. Your voice is shaking. Let me turn on the light. No, no, please. Come into the bedroom, Phil. I'll turn on the light. Soaked with perspiration. What is it? Let me get your robe. Where do you feel ill? What is stomach? But your head? Sit down on the rocker. You look ghastly. Mm. Laura, may- maybe if I if, if I had a brandy. Yeah, I'll telephone Paul Shelton. No, 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 no. Please, he's he's, he's operating at seven. I've just got a chill or something. You wipe your face with a wet cloth, and I'll be right up. I heard them. Every word. They're coming back. Killers. Oh, what shall I do? Is it too late to call the police and turn in the money? Maybe not. But give up $80,000 because I'm afraid of a pair of hoodlums? What have I got to be afraid of? Say they confront me. I, I, I tell them that I haven't got the money. Would they risk shooting me? No. I won't give up that money. I won't. Here's the brandy, sweetheart. Oh, thanks. Thanks. That helps. Phil. When I uh, walked through the living room to the bar on the porch... Yes? Two men were staring from behind the front hedge through the living room window. Phil, I'm afraid... After all other sins are old, avarice 
remains young. A very old French proverb. Chance has allowed avarice to place temptation before Philip Chambers. He is already a harried man. Will his sense of moral values be strong enough to overcome temptation? Or will he persist in holding on to the stolen money? We'll find out when I return with Act Two. Philip Chambers and his wife, Laura, somehow got through the remainder of the night. After Laura's fright about seeing two men stare through her living room windows, Philip, in a brave display, turned on the front lights and walked outside defiantly, a fireplace poker in his hand. That assured Laura. She insisted on telephoning the police and reporting what she had seen. Captain Ron said he'd have a squad car prowl the property. Then the chambers went to bed and to a fitful sleep. The next morning, over coffee... You all right, Phil? You look pretty ragged. Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. I'd better be. I'm seeing that girl at noon and going to lunch. Mm -hmm. You taking the train? Uh, The 10.05. Darling, you're a bundle of nerves. Phil, why? You keep telling me that, Laura, and that hardly helps. Look, I wish you'd just forget about me. I've got a lot on my mind, if you'll excuse me. I'm sorry, Phil. I'm sorry, but you worry me. Is something bothering you that I don't know about? Survival. Survival? We're not that bad off. We're doing all right. Look, I'll be in the basement. Well, I'll drive you to the train. Don't bother. I'll call a cab. But that's foolish. One minute you're talking about survival, the next minute you're throwing away money out on a cab. Laura, just stop talking, will you please? So strange. Let's come over here. Let's speak to Dr. Shelton. Maybe he can find out. Five. Four. Five. Seven. Dr. Shelton's residence. Hi, Joni. Laura. Yo, um, look, when does Paul get home from the hospital? This is Monday, and he operated early. I say, uh, he ought to be home by four. Why? Something wrong? I think so. But I don't know. Uh, it's Phil. Don't he tell you what? He's, uh, taking the 10.05 to the city. Can you come over at 10.30? I'll be back then, and I've I got to talk this out. Of course. You sound serious. I am, I am. Will you come over? Of course. I'll see you at 10.30. There. That ought to be safe. Who'd think of looking behind a basement window and under the porch? Oh. Oh, I got the shakes. Uh, Why don't I take the money with me into the city? I I could leave it in a locker at Grand Central. If the police find the money in my possession. Oh, no, no. I've got to bluff my way out of this. Eighty thousand dollars dropped into my hands. I can't give it up. Now, look, I I mustn't be afraid. Oh, my stomach keeps turning. I still have that lunch meeting. You look as if you hadn't slept a wink last night, Laura. I didn't. At about three o'clock, Phil was awake. He came up late and slept on the upstairs porch. I heard him stirring. So I checked on him. He was covered with perspiration, shaking like a leaf. And how was he this morning? Well, he looked exhausted, but he didn't have the shakes. He was all right when I dropped him at the train. Well, he has that important lunch today, doesn't he? Could that be it? It could be, but I don't think so. Phil's had summit meetings before. No, it's something else. I can't find out what it is. Maybe Paul can. Maybe. Paul's not a psychiatrist. Yes, I know, I know, but he's a doctor, and Phil might confide in him. Besides, Paul's his best friend. But Phil wouldn't say what was bothering him. No. When I persisted in my questions, he said survival. That's odd. (laughs) What did he mean? Continuing to live? To stay alive? I think it has something to do with the robbery of the Grove City Bank. Oh, Laura, for heaven's sake. Why? What's that got to do with Phil? Well, ever since I mentioned the robbery to him, Phil seemed distracted. 
When he read the article in the news, he grew tense. He began to perspire. I didn't think anything of it at the time. But since what's happened, I've been trying to reconstruct Phil's behavior. I think it springs somehow from the robbery. I've never been so frightened in my life. Laura. I went down for brandy when he felt so badly. I didn't switch on the lights. I walked down the stairs from the bedroom and across the living room toward the porch. And that's when I almost screamed. Good heavens, what happened? Two men standing behind the hedge in front of the living room windows and looking in. What? Looking through your windows? You think that the stolen money was... Or is somewhere around your property? I don't know what to think. Have you told the police? I telephoned them last night. And they sent a prowl car to snoop around. Well, did you mention your theory to the police? I mean, about the money being hidden somewhere around your house? No. First, it sounds far-fetched. Second, I've got a feeling that somehow it concerns Phil. How could it concern Phil? You mean, he may know where the money is hidden? I don't know what I mean, Joan. Talk about imagination. Laura, you're as bad as Phil with his talk about survival. He has a bad case of nerves and... Survival? He said he was worried about survival. Now, isn't that the word you said? Yes, that's the word he used. I thought he meant our survival. But what if he meant... He was afraid, literally, of his own survival. That would mean he knows something about the robbery that he's not telling. But you don't believe that he found the money, do you? I don't know. But if he did, knowing Phil, the kind of man he is, he'd just have called the police. No question about it. And he would have told me. Oh, excuse me, back doorbell. I'll be right back, Joan. Take your time. I'll be out on the porch. Good morning. I'd like to read the water meter. Oh, uh, down the steps to the basement and watch your head. The ceiling's low. The garden looks wonderful, Laura. Yes, it does. Phil takes such great pride in it. Laura, hmm. if Phil meant he's afraid about his own survival, and I think he knows something. Either he saw the men who stole the money and can identify them, or he knows where the money is hidden. That I can't believe. If Phil knew that, I'd know it. And you just said Phil, being the kind of man he's always been, would return it. Yes. Well, maybe Paul can drag it out of him. <laughs> Whatever it might be. I'm worried sick. I have a premonition of... Of danger or to tragedy. Something in the air. A sense of impending evil. Hello. Laura, something's occurred to me. What, Joan? I was on your porch at 10.30 and the doorbell rang. Who was it? Well, the, the man who uh, reads the water meter. Why? Well, he didn't come to my house. And when a man comes from the water department, he reads the meters at all the houses in the neighborhood. Yes, he does. And another thing. I went shopping at noon, and as I drove out of my driveway, a man walked out from the back of your house. Did someone else call on you? No. You mean that uh, the man who read the meter was in my basement from 10.30 until noon? Some man was, but he wasn't a man from the water department. Well, then we're, we're right. The stolen money's around here someplace, and the man was one of the thieves. That's what I think. Has Phil returned from New York? No, no, and it's, it's after five. Well, you shouldn't be in that house alone until we get to the bottom of this strange situation. Paul got stuck with another emergency operation. He won't be home until quite late. Oh. But I'll send him by after I tell him everything we think. Oh, but the, the poor man will be exhausted. No, no, no. Why don't... not exhausted. He'll be by to see Phil. And then you come across to see me, all right? Yeah. Thank you, Joan. Oh, uh, there's the front door. Phil? Here I am. All in one piece. It's, uh, it's Phil. He sounds a little tipsy. I'll see you later, Joan. Goodbye. I'm on the porch, honey. (laughs) 
You'll excuse me for having had one more than I, I should have had. Uh, after lunch... Uh... Well, you don't have to explain, darling. I take it you uh, didn't get the assignment? Uh, how did you know that? <laughs> you got second sight or something? Or something. Was it unpleasant? No, no. About as I expected. Nice girl. <laughs> Young enough to be my daughter. Uh, she had white wine, and I had a few martinis. Oh, dear. Yeah, oh, dear. Oh. So you proceeded to lord it over the young woman who sips white wine? Lord it over? No, that's not so. We got talking about what I'd be doing as a consultant in copy. Now, I know something about copy, Laura. Yes, you do. Me begging for a job. I used to run that joint before that kid was out of Dr. Denton's. Can't be 26. I was about 30 when she was born. Let me fix you a cup of coffee. I don't want any coffee. You say that I'm bombed, Laura? Well, I'm not. I never felt better. I just had lots of things on my mind. Including the robbery of the Grove City Bank? Robbery? Do you know who the men are who robbed the bank, Phil? Me? Well, how would I know? I never saw them in my life. Say, what is all this? Remember the two men I saw looking in through the living room window this morning at 3 a.m.? Yeah. What were two men doing looking through the window, Phil? Well, uh, well, search me. We think they had hidden the stolen money and were looking for it. We? Laura, who is we? Joan and me. Have you been talking this over with Joan? Why not? She's my best friend and Paul is yours. You and Joan turned amateur detectives, huh? Haven't the two of you got anything better to talk about than that robbery? Frankly, no. Because ever since you heard about it, you haven't been Philip Chambers. Oh, and who have I been? A nervous wreck. And you're making a nervous wreck out of me. Tell me honestly, Phil. Do you know anything about the men who committed the robbery? Do you know who they are? Do they hide the money on our property? Are you in danger, danger of survival? Lots of questions. Give me some answers, Phil. What are you so worked up about, Laura? This is a police matter. Just, just leave it to the police. I've notified the police. What? Last night? And again today. A man came to the house and said he wanted to read the water meter. He wasn't from the water company. He was in our basement for almost an hour and a half. I see. What? What do you see? Well, well maybe you're right. I, I don't know anything about any of this, but you, you just might be right. Maybe the thieves did hide that money around here. I better check. Let's have the police do the checking. Now, don't you worry about me. I'll just look around. Phil, are you in danger? Now, nothing's going to happen to me. Huh? It's getting dark outside. It's starting to rain. I'll be across the street with Joan. Hello, Mr. Chambers. Uh, who are you? Where have you got it, Mr. Chambers? What are you doing in my basement? How did you get in here? Let's have it, Mr. Chambers. You don't want to get hurt, do you? It's a real gun. I've used it before. I know how to use it. Let him have it, Nick. Let's get out of here. Not until he turns it over to us. Now, how about it, Mr. Chambers? What is it you want? The money, 80 grand. It's ours, and you have it someplace down here. Now, turn it over, or I'll blow your head off. is like quicksand. Once you've taken the first risky step, you cannot save yourself from its grasp. Philip Chambers may lose his life unless he gives up what is not rightly his. He has everything to lose, nothing to gain. Or has greed so infected his mind that he will look down the barrel of a revolver and believe that he can stop a bullet with his beautiful dream of a fortune and the security it will give him. I'll return shortly with Act Three. Philip Chambers found $80,000 at the bottom of his garbage bin at the back of his nice colonial house in exclusive Morris Manor, 30-some minutes from Broadway. 
Despite a lifetime of ethical exactitude, Mr. Chambers didn't hesitate a minute before deciding that fate had dropped a rich token of her affection into his deserving hands. He'd keep the money stolen from the bank in Grove City. But the thieves, there were three, but one was killed when the escape car crashed, also want the money. I'm waiting, Mr. Chambers. I don't know what you're talking about. And I want you out of here. <laughs> He's going to be tough, Stud. You want me to soften him up? Not yet. Stud here is pretty good at making a guy talk, Mr. Chambers. Now, we don't want to hurt you, so just turn over the money and we'll run along. I haven't got your money. We're wasting time, Nick. You got it, all right. We hid it in the garbage can last Saturday night. You found it Sunday morning and hid it. Because when we came back for it, it was gone. Now, where have you got it? If you think that there's money down here, you're crazy. If there were, why didn't you find it? You were down here for an hour and a half this morning. I'm getting impatient, Mr. Chambers. If you don't turn over that money in one minute, stud, to go to work on you. You wouldn't get away with it. You think I'm going to stand here and do nothing while that gorilla comes at me? Now, look, I've got a pair of pretty good fists, and I'll yell my head off. Oh, let me get at this Hold it, Nick. hold it. I have a better idea. We'll kill his wife. How would you like that, Mr. Chambers? Are you dirty? I wouldn't mind killing you. We don't care about you, but we care about the money. And with you dead, we still haven't got it. But we intend to get it because you're going to give it to us. Now, you have it for us by midnight. You leave it next to the garbage bin. We'll pick it up, and then Mrs. Chambers will be all right, and you'll be all right. Otherwise, you'll have only yourself to blame. Uh-huh. What's to prevent me from calling the police? You won't do that, Mr. Chambers. If you don't have the money outside by midnight, I'll tell the police you have the money. You think they'd believe you? Your tip against my word and my reputation? We got confidence in the police, ain't we, Nick? That's right. Well, they'll break you down, Mr. Chambers. We have our way, they have theirs. And you'll slip up. Maybe not right away, but soon. But it won't get to the police. You know why? Because if the money isn't there tonight, we take care of your wife tomorrow. He ain't kidding, mister. So why don't you give us the money now and save all the sweat? If I had the money that you're talking about, I would see you in hell before I gave it to you. Stud. (laughs) You're still pretty fast, Stud, my boy. (laughs) He was wide open. Now let's get out of here. And we'll watch the house. It might be an interesting few hours. Good night, Mr. Chambers. Laura, it's inconceivable to me that Phil might have all that money. Phil. My impression is that Phil's the kind who always returns the change if a waiter's made a mistake. Yes. But don't imagine having not change but $80,000 in your hands. No, Phil's always been scrupulously honest. But he thinks about money all the time. The expenses. Where's the money coming from to pay them? He reviews our situation almost every day. Well, that's fear. Sure, of course it is. But he's only 55. We have money. Not much, but enough to get by on. So once in a while, Phil manages to relax. Not for long. There's always an unexpected expense. It throws his calculations out the window, and then he starts to fret. And when he frets, he begins to feel sorry for himself. I never realized he was that upset. Well, he'd never show it to his friends. He's too proud for that. Imagine what he must have felt when a fortune drops into his hands. You've convinced yourself that Phil does have that money, haven't you? But it's the only explanation I can give for his weird behavior. If anything happened to Phil... I know. I know... Wait a minute. I think I hear the car. If it's Paul, we'll send him across the street to Phil right away. Oh, give the poor doctor a few minutes to relax. He can relax after he questions Phil. Then maybe all of us will be able to relax. Tell me about it, Phil. I... I'd rather not, Paul. I find your front door open. I walk in and call hello. No answer. I find you in the basement, sitting with your head in your hands, covered with perspiration, shaking as if you had a fever, and you won't tell me about it. After all, I am a doctor, Phil. I... I just can't. Your face is swollen. 
You've been crying. But that doesn't entirely account for the swollen face, does it? No. Did you fall down? Or walk into something? Paul, I... I got knocked out. Ah. Interesting. Ready to spill the beans? I don't know how I can bring myself to it, Paul. I'm a good listener. Uh, mind if I fix myself a drink? No, no, of course not. Forgive me for not offering you one. You want one? Uh, yeah, a small one. I, I had enough at lunch in this afternoon to, to shrivel my liver to the size of a raisin. Mm-hmm. And uh, what was your excuse? Well, I, I didn't get that consultant's job. Here you are. Yeah, yeah thanks. Well, that's hardly the end of the world, Phil. No, no, it isn't. Imagine being interviewed or approved of by a 26-year-old girl with stringy hair and no brassiere. Gee, I felt like a captive of the youth army. So it wasn't the lunch and the unpleasant interview that put you into a stew. Oh, no, it wasn't unpleasant, just stupid. So your annoyance drove you from lunch. Where? Biltmore Bar? Your club? Yeah, the club. I sat at the bar and the bartender listened. Ha-ha, poor man. Here's to all bartenders, the unlicensed psychiatrists or priests to an unending line of confessors. All right, my friend. Stop beating around the bush. Do you have that stolen money? I... I yes. We thought so. I found it. Sunday morning in the garbage bin. I, I was going to use my shredder, so I, I went to the garbage bin and... Well, there it was. And you decided to keep it. $80,000. Paul, you don't know what that could mean to me and Laura. Sure I do. Fear, guilt, self-destruction. Look what's happened to you, Paul, in just 24 hours. You're a bundle of nerves. You lost the possibility of a good job, and you've been knocked on your can by a hoodlum who probably wouldn't hesitate to shoot you down like a mad dog. Oh, they mean business, Paul. I don't doubt it. Where is the money? Well, it's, it's in a box wrapped in a plastic bag behind that basement window that opens out onto the porch. Get it for me. What? Bring me the box of money. You? Me. I want it, and I want it now. I'll get my car and turn the money into the police. Oh, but Paul, what do they think? You see, I, I've i held out on them. Laura will be disgraced. I can't face my friends after they hear that I held the money for two days. I'm your friend, and you faced me. The others don't need to know. I found the money in my garage. Oh, I don't know, Paul. These are tough guys. They may try something on you. You mean mug me? Or worse... They said they'd be back for the money at midnight. If it wasn't outside by the garbage bin, they'd, they'd get Laura. Dirty thugs. Oh, look, maybe I should do what they asked. And let vermin like that get away with an $80,000 theft. Never. That money belongs in the hands of the police and then the bank. You get the box. I'll get my car. And don't dawdle. <laughs> He's not coming to the door. Where's he going? The driveway. What in the world is he... He's backing out his... What's going on? He's parking in front of the house and walking to the door. Laura, you don't suppose... I don't know what's going on. If Phil has the money, maybe he'll give it to Paul and... Don't look. Phil's handing Paul some kind of package. That must be it. And Paul's returning to his car. Laura, two men have come out from behind your hedge. Look. They're sneaking up on Paul. One of them has a gun. Oh, no. Paul, Paul. No. No. I'm going to shoot Paul. Get the package, stud. Okay. Keys are in his hand. Come on. I'm in. Get going, Nick. That thing's going to wake the whole town. Oh, my God. Phil. 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 Where are you? I'm on the back porch. What's all the excitement? Two men. One of them. One of them shot Paul. What? Paul. Paul's been shot. He's lying in the street. Oh, Paul. Phil, wake up. Can't you get it through your head? A man shot Paul. They stole his car and got away. Do something. Call the police. Paul. Shot. He was here. We had a good talk. Paul's my friend. My best friend. He's a good doctor, too. Nobody shoots a good doctor. Nobody shoots a doctor. Paul. Shot. Darling. You... 
look so odd. Your eyes, they're blank like those of a statue. Don't. He's lost his mind. Phil, sit down. What? Phil, what... What was in the package? Package. I know what was in it. But I don't... I don't want to know. It may have left one man dead. And my husband worse off than dead. In 1732, Thomas Fuller wrote that there is no vice like avarice. Honesty, no matter how shop-worn the old adage, really is the best policy. It may not lead you to untold riches, but uh, it's a safeguard for a respectable and safe life. What finally happened to these four friends? I'll tell you when I return shortly. Teledisc is proud to present over three hours of the world's best-loved music. The Classical Collection, an exquisite four-album library of music by the masters. Beethoven, Mozart, Tchaikovsky, Chopin. Formed by the world's greatest artists and recorded direct from the studio tapes, the Classical Collection comes wrapped in its own gift box with a special program guide and is available only from Teledisc and not in any store. Three hours of beautiful music on four records or two extra long play cassettes, yours for only $19.95 plus shipping. To order, call 1-800-642-7400. The Classical Collection, your musical treasure for years to come. Call 1-800-642-7400. Operators are standing by. Credit cards accepted and satisfaction is guaranteed or your money back. Call 1-800-642-7400 to order your copy of The Classical Collection today. The phrase, the root of all evil, has echoed down the corridor of time because this man covets what another man has. And civilization has never been able entirely to constrain greed. Philip Chambers almost cost his best friend his life. Almost. Dr. Shelton had been shot in the back, but he survived. Phil became an instant vegetable, and weeds overgrew his mind, choking out any hope of a return to normal life. When so well-respected, educated, and intelligent a man as Philip Chambers can succumb to greed, beware. Our cast included Norman Rose, Anne Shepard, Elliot Reed, Marion Seldes, and George Petrie. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Hi, I'm Joseph Campanella. If you're a kid who's got troubles, you've got a friend at Boys Town. Whether you're a boy or a girl, Boys Town has a caring person just a phone call away who will really listen to your problems and help you solve them. If you're running away, being abused, using drugs or alcohol, pregnant, or just need somebody to talk to, Call Boys Town's hotline. It's 1-800-448-3000. There's no charge for the call, and you can call any time. If you're a parent and you're having problems controlling your children or keeping yourself from hurting them, 
you've got a friend at Boys Town, too. At Boys Town's hotline, you'll talk to someone who understands and can help you find the help you need fast and close to home. Call Boys Town's hotline toll-free, 1-800-448-3000. That's 1-800-448-3000. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. WWJ News Radio 95. Good morning. I'm Brad Bianchi. In the next few minutes, we'll have complete details on these stories. Michigan Super Lotto jackpot was good to a couple ticket holders who will split a $5 million jackpot. Another ethics charge has been raised against Michigan U.S. Senator Donald Regal. Detroit and some of its suburbs could be in line for a rail line. Those stories are coming up along with sports. At 1.15, it was the Thanksgiving Day win for the Detroit Lions. CBS covers the world and the nation with news next at the top of the hour. The WWJ Weather Command forecast, mostly cloudy, breezy, and cold this morning, a low of 18 degrees with the possibility of some snow flurries. Sunshine Friday, not quite as cold. Cold will get to about 34 degrees. Right now in Detroit, partly cloudy, 24 is the temperature. All news, all the time. News Radio 95, WWJ, Detroit. CBS News. I'm Jim Shenevy. Venezuelan President Carlos Andres Perez says he will meet with Salvadoran rebel leaders in the morning and may end up serving as a mediator for any peace talks with the country's government. Guerrilla leaders have offered to honor a United Nations verified ceasefire if else.